Welcome back to 162, everybody. I almost said 262. Um, we are uh, out of Mars and the upside down, it appears, because there's actually some non-orange light that's happened today, but it's still uh, bad air quality, so that's not great. But um, let's see what we can do today. And continuing our topics, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the user's view of the system so that uh, when we really dive in, to details inside the operating system, you'll have a good clue uh, why we're doing what we're doing. So today we're going to um, talk about communication between processes. We were talking about how to create them uh, up and how to uh, create threads, but now we're going to talk about communicating between them. We're going to introduce pipes and sockets and uh, TCP IP connection set up for web servers, for instance. And the thing to think about here is our mental model here is going to be uh, process A on one side of the network talks to process B on the other side, and they use read and write just like uh, the file interface. OK. So the other thing I just wanted to keep everybody in mind here is we talked about creating processes with fork. So the fork basically copies the current process, all of its address spaces. The state of the original process is duplicated in the parent and the child. Um, that's the address space, the file descriptors, et cetera. Uh, and what I'm showing here uh, basically is giving you a brief uh, way to look at this. Uh, when fork returns, once the two processes have been created, fork returns in each of them. And in one of them, it returns something bigger than zero. That's the parent. And the other one, it returns zero, and that's the child. And I um, show you this on this side here. Uh, once we forked, this is the parent, uh, the if CPID greater than zero. And it's actually executing a wait, which says it's going to pause or go to sleep until the child exits, which is this other piece of code with a 42, which is, in this case, an error. So most cases with Unix, uh, return code of zero is uh, what happens when there are no errors. So I saw an interesting uh, question up on uh, Piazza I thought I would say something about. So the question is, why fork? I mean, if it's really creating two identical processes, what's the point? And the point is, there are two processes where there was one before, OK? So um, fork is basically how you create new processes. Uh, this is mostly true because, as I mentioned here, Linux has something called clone, which gives you more options uh, than regular fork. But fork was the original mechanism way back in the first uh, versions of Unix. And so its semantics are partially historical. Um, but the uh, question of why fork is really that's the way you get new processes. So um, last time, we talked a lot about the fact that uh, in Unix, pretty much everything's a file, OK? Uh, obviously, uh, you can talk to files with read, write. You can talk to devices. You can do interprocessor communication, uh, which we're going to show today. But that interface is pretty constant, OK? And among other things, it's going to allow this simple composition, uh, find piping into grep, piping into word count, et cetera, that you're um, getting used to uh, with your programming at user level, and you're going to actually implement when we get around to project two. Uh, this particular modality of, of communication with the kernel is you open everything before you use it. OK? And so uh, all of the access control checking is done on open. And if you get returned something, then you know that you were successful in opening. Um, the other important thing is that in Unix, the kernel is extraordinarily agnostic, OK? Um, it's agnostic to what the underlying structure of the data is. That means that everything is essentially byte-oriented, regardless of whether it's coming off of a disk 4K at a time or off of a keyboard one byte at a time. Now, the question of uh, if processors are composed of threads, does forking a process fork all the threads? So we answered that uh, last time. The answer is no. So you got to be very careful. Only the um, only the thread that actually executed fork is uh, recreated in the child process. So the other thing we briefly talked about was the fact that kernel buffers reads and writes to give you that byte-oriented uh, behavior. So it basically takes from the disk, it might take 4K or 8K or 16K at a time, and it buffers it internal to the kernel. So then you can read 13 bytes and then 12 bytes and then 196 bytes without having to go to the disk all the time because that would be extraordinarily uh, inefficient. Uh, writes are also buffered. So when you write, you don't have to wait until it gets pushed out to the disk before it returns back to the user. Okay. And then because we had open before use, we also have an explicit close operation, 
that uh, typically you use when you want to close something out and clean everything up, although the kernel uh, will do that if your process just ends and you haven't closed things. So I wanted to put together uh, kind of a walking pattern for thinking about today's lecture. Um, and this is going to be one process, so we're not talking about inter-process yet, but it's a web server, which you've all used a lot. And here we have the standard three layers. We've got uh, the user level, and notice that even a server is running at user level. We have the kernel, which is all of the kernel code that's giving uh, the glue and the um, virtual machine and so on is all done in the kernel. And then the hardware, of course, has got things like networking and disk and so on. And so we could imagine that the server process starts up and the first thing it does is it's gonna open um, some sockets to uh, get ready to listen to incoming requests. We'll get to that in a moment. But notice that that uh, first thing it does is a read and that read goes to the socket and it has to take a system call to do that. And the first thing that happens is wait. Okay, why? Because there's no data yet. So that uh, server gets put to sleep or the thread that did this gets put to sleep, the server could be multi-threaded, as we'll talk about, because there's no data. And notice we've used read, so we're actually going to be communicating with the network in the same way that we did with the file system, okay? And sometime later, data is gonna come in from remotely over the network, and for instance, this might be a request to the web server for reading a certain URL. It'll generate an interrupt, we haven't talked about that yet, it'll copy things into the uh, socket buffer, and then poof, the wait condition is no longer gonna be true and we're gonna be able to wake up and re remove ourselves from the kernel and basically return from read. So this, we, we went into the kernel with read, but we stayed there for a while and then eventually we returned from read with data. And so there's a request. And now that request, since we're talking about a web server, is likely to need to get something off the disk. So it executes a read to a file descriptor for the disk. Uh, file system. And now it's going to wait a little bit because potentially the disk has to be accessed with the device driver. So that may take some time to pull things off the disk. And then the disk interface will eventually hand back the requested data, which again will remove the wait condition and return from the read system call with data, at which point we format the reply like a um, HTTP re uh, reply. We go back to our network socket with a write and that, um, again, is a syscall boundary, which will send the packet outgoing. And notice that we don't have a wait condition here because I'm assuming that the buffers aren't full and the data just goes out. And of course, after 12, we're gonna just repeat and uh, do another read, okay? And we're gonna see that a lot in a little bit of the lecture. Um, today, we're gonna talk more about this network communication thing here. How does this work, okay? But before we get there, I did wanna point out one thing, which is, what you see here is, uh, if you recall, we were stalled on our read, both for the network and for the disk for a little while, and the kernel took all the responses in from the disk and from uh, the network and saved up and buffered them so that we only got returned what we asked for. Okay, so the boxes here uh, inside the kernel are slots for bytes or whatever. Okay, think of them, this is a generic queue of some sort. The, uh, the case of write means essentially that uh, when we write our data, it goes into the kernel and is buffered by the kernel and we can return immediately back to the server to uh, do another read if we want to. Okay, now, again, to remember, uh, we talked about both high and low level APIs for file data and uh, also for IO now. Here's an example of the high level streams which all have, almost all of them have an F in front of them. So like F open and F close and F read and F write. And they, um, when they return, they return a pointer to a file data structure, okay? And that file data structure has inside of it the fact that this was successfully opened and potentially um, if it was successfully opened, uh, that also has information required to do the reads or the writes, depending on what you ask for. An error is returned uh, from the operating system and from the library in this case with a null file star. So if your file star is, is zero or null, then you know that it failed. Um, and you use this pointer that was returned for all subsequent operations, okay? And data in the high level streams are buffered in user space in addition to the kernel. 
Okay, so now here's a question. Is the kernel buffer network traffic indefinitely before any data gets returned at all to read? So um, if you don't execute a read and you open a socket and a bunch of data arrives, then what'll happen is it'll start filling up in the socket and eventually that'll fill up and it'll back up to the uh, sender and tell it to stop sending data. And then as you start reading, <coughs> it'll pull data out of the network and uh, empty the socket buffer and then things will get started again. We'll talk about that later in the term. To contrast this high level stream, uh, streaming infrastructure where there's actually buffering at user level, we have the low level raw interface which is basically using system calls directly. That's like open, create, and close, okay? And notice that what returns from them, from open on success is a file descriptor, okay? And that file descriptor says, uh, which file was opened. But the way it says that is not something you can figure out. It's something the kernel does. It has a table inside of file descriptor to file descript description, okay, data structures. And so um, you're going to get back an integer here that you're not going to know what to do with. The one integer that does matter, for instance, is less than zero or minus one says this was a failure. Okay, and then you got to check error. And then finally, since streams, that's the high level, and up in the um, system calls, that's a low level like open, create, close, or tightly related to each other. If you take a stream and you run file no on it, file number, you'll actually get back the internal file descriptor that's uh, part of that stream. Okay. All right. So the, um, the, the flags here are saying whether you're doing reading or writing to the file, that's what you want to do to it. The uh, bit uh, permissions are what other people can do to it. So this is kind of what you want to do locally, and the permissions are what other people can do for it. Okay. Um, the question is, does this lead to a vulnerability where other uh, methods could try a random number to ex uh, access a file they shouldn't? So I'm assuming that what you mean is you randomly choose an integer, and then you try to use it in read or write. So the point is that all of the access control is done on open, and then the kernel for your process puts uh, a pointer into there of uh, a mapping between the file descriptor number and the actual internals uh, of the open file. And the best you would get by randomly selecting something is uh, maybe you'll pick one that was open, but then you already have permission to use it because it's your process. If you pick something that's not there, there's no way you'll get another uh, person's file because that mapping between numbers and open file descriptors are is actually uh, unique to the process. So random, random descriptor numbers doesn't help you here. Now, um, we also talked about the representation of a process inside the kernel. So if you look here, um, the process, of course, has its address space, which we're going to do a lot with in a couple of weeks. Um, it's got registers for at least one thread, which is there's always one primary thread in a process. There could be more. It's got this file descriptor table, which maps numbers to open file descriptions. And notice, by the way, there's always 0, 1, and 2 that are started up when you start a process. We didn't include them here, um, but we did talk about them last time. This is uh, the uh, standard out, standard error, and standard in. Okay. Um, so this descriptor ta table gives you a redirection, and uh, each open file has a, a description that's in internal kernel uh, data structures, okay? So file descriptors are per process, file descriptions are not necessarily, okay? And we talked about that last time. For instance, here, uh, here's process one and two, perhaps this is the parent process is one and the child is number two. After fork, you, uh, you copy the address space and the registers of the thread and the file descriptor table, which happens to point to now a shared file description. And if you take a look at the end of last uh, lecture, we talked about some of the uh, good and bad consequences of this. Okay. Um, and then, of course, 0, 1, and 2 are uh, typically attached to the ter terminal. Okay, But uh, on the other hand, you can redirect them, which is where piping comes into play. Okay. The position variable is how many bytes you've read so far in the file, except uh, you got to be careful because this is the position that the kernel knows of. If you're using the streaming interfaces with F in front of them, there's a different buffer inside of the user space that also keeps track of the position for your reading through the F read and F write. 
And if these two, uh, so these two uh, pointers are not necessarily the same, and you should take a look. I, uh, the very end of uh, one of the recent lectures, there was a discussion of that. Okay, and yes, the position variables, how many bytes, not that you've read so far, it's the position of the next thing that's gonna be read, so that you can change the position with the various seek operations. Okay, so if you were to seek back to 100, read, seek back to 100, read, you could do that over and over again and keep reading the same thing, and this position wouldn't change in that case. Now, um, okay, so that's a very quick reminder of, of things. I just wanted to talk to about some brief administrivia. Of course, homework one is, is almost due, so hopefully you're uh, making great progress on that. Project one should be in full swing, so that's been released. Uh, your groups have been set and your discussion sessions hopefully have been set. So um, you're, all, you're all up to, for good here. It's uh, time to get moving. Make sure that you figure out how to have your partners meet uh, regularly, okay? Because that's important. Um, you should be attending your permanent discussion session. Uh, remember to turn on your camera and Zoom. Um, and uh, discussion attendance is mandatory so your TAs can get to know you, so that's important. Okay. Um, the other thing I'm sure you're well aware of is our first midterm's coming up October 1st, uh, roughly two weeks from Thursday. Sorry, this says three weeks from tomorrow. I didn't change that, but it's two weeks from Thursday. Um, and uh, be prepared, okay? Um, the last thing is, again, plan on how your group collaborates. We're going to be giving you guys credit for um, showing us some selfies of all four of you uh, talking in Zoom with your cameras on. But um, except for just that, you should consider doing that. So try to meet multiple times a week. Because even in uh, real space, not virtual space, people that don't meet regularly, the projects end up failing at the end of the term and you don't want to do that. So try to keep your groups moving. Okay. Now we had a couple of questions um, on the uh, on the chat here. Um, so the question about, uh, since syscalls are expensive, is it possible to pre-request threads and then schedule them at user level? The answer is yes. And we'll talk more about that. I'm going to give you a brief example toward the end of the lecture where we talk about thread pools, for instance, uh, for web service, web services. So that's a, a good idea. Um, now the, uh, the selfie, by the way, that I was talking about is showing a, a video, uh, a um, screen capture from Zoom, okay? Um, because you're supposed to be using your cameras with meeting with your uh, partners as well, okay? You don't have to have video, uh, a screenshot's fine. Um, and then the other uh, question is, will the descriptor have the same value across processes? Only if uh, the file descriptor is shared because you had a parent that uh, executed fork, then the child will have all the same file descriptors if you open the same file in different processes independently, there's absolutely nothing that says that the file descriptors have to be the same unless you're doing some tricks with dupe or dupe2, which is something you're going to learn well how to use. Okay. So today we're going to talk about communicating between processes. So what if a process, there's multiple of them, wants to communicate with another one? Uh, why might they want to do that? Well, perhaps they're sharing a task. So both, you know, both of them are doing something. Or perhaps there's a cooperative venture with some security implications. What do I mean by that? Well, clearly if you have a bunch of threads in a single process, it's easy for them to communicate. But perhaps you don't trust everything that that other code is doing. And so you'd like to have separate processes, but then you want to uh, have them communicate. Okay, and this is not uncommon. So the process abstraction is designed to discourage this, right? It's set up to make it hard for one process to mess with another one or the operating system. Okay, that's by design, that's a feature. So we gotta do something special um, that's agreed upon by both processes. And so think of this as punching a hole in the security, but doing so in a way that's uh, okay to the two processes. So we start off with no communication, then we've gotta communicate, okay? And we call this inter-process communication, not surprisingly. Now, if you remember, I just wanted to reemphasize this, and we're going to talk a lot more about page table mappings and so on uh, in a week or so. But if you remember, there's a page table, 
that does these translation maps for you. And it basically says that process one's code goes to the table and maps to some part of physical space that's different from process two's code. So notice they're using completely different parts of the physical DRAM. And the same for data, heap, and stack. And as a result, they can't uh, alter each other's data, right? That's by design. So that's part of our protection. So um, we got to figure out something else for communication. And if you think about it, we've already talked a lot about something that works, right? We've talked about um, how you could have a producer, which is a writer, and a consumer, which is a reader, separated in time, co communicate. How do we do that with a file? OK, we already talked a lot about how when a, pr a parent process creates a child process, they share uh, the dis file descriptor table. And so if you have a file that's been open for reading and writing, and then you uh, produce a child process, then the two of you can exchange data through the, the disk. OK, so that's easy. OK, can anybody say why this might not be desirable? Yeah, so slow, why slow? Well, you're not really trashing the disk per se, but it is slow because what you're saying is in order for communication, which is already in memory, you've got to go out to disk and back. Okay, so this, this doesn't seem particularly desirable for that reason, but I do want to point out that this idea of writing to some file descriptor and then reading from a file descriptor is our standard Unix IO mechanism. So whatever we come up with, is going to be very different here. Okay. Now I did see an interesting uh, question in the chat, and this is going to be the first time I tell you this today. So here's your fact for the day. Uh, does anybody have any idea of how many instructions you lose by waiting for a disk to pull data? Okay. Well, it's not a hundred million, but it is a million. Okay. So a million is a good rule of thumb, um, especially when you have multi-issue processors that are running more than one thing at once. So think at least a million, OK? And so going out to disk and back is not good. Uh, it's very slow. Now, of course, what we haven't talked about yet is caching inside the kernel. So in reality, you could write and read without ever going out to disk. Uh, but this interface, by its very nature, tries to push data out to disk. and so. I'm basically taking something that ought to be a quick communication through memory and you know, adding a disk onto it for some goofy reason. So this seems like this might not be always desirable. And you may want something else when you don't care about keeping your data persistent. Is there a faster way? Yes, there is. Now, one thing we also won't talk about today is this. Do you see what I did here? See the red? So what I did was, yes, in initially it was impossible for uh, processor program one to talk to processor program two through memory because we mapped it that way. But we can also choose to map certain parts of memory so that both of them share it. So that's what's read here, both map to the same page in memory. And then you can do things like have data structures that are shared. You can have linked lists that are shared, all sorts of cool stuff. So this is um, pretty uncontrolled but is fast. And we'll talk about how to make this work after we've gone through how, uh, how um, we can communicate uh, um, and set this up. Okay, So we're not going to get there yet. Okay, So we're going to need locks. We're going to need a lot of stuff. So before we go to this shared memory model, let's understand a few things. Okay, But today's inter-process communication is going to be a little different than this. Okay, What else can we do? All right, so disks aren't great. Well, what if we ask the kernel to help us in other ways, like an in-memory queue? OK, that's a producer puts stuff on the queue, and the consumer consumes stuff. And we'll use system calls for security reasons, so we're not going to open up uh, security. And uh, by the way, you know, if you do this shared memory thing, you got to make sure that you're OK with the process, complete, the other process completely reading and writing the data that you're reading and writing. OK, so you have to do this carefully. But what else could we do? Well, here we go. Here's a queue. OK, so notice this is not a disk anymore. But process A executes a write system call, which puts stuff in the queue. And process B executes a read system call, which re uh, removes things from the queue. And now suddenly, we've got communication. Wouldn't that be great? 
Okay. Um, so some details before we figure out how to do this, some details of what we might want is, uh, for instance, well, when data is written by A, it's held in memory until B reads it. Okay, that sounds good. Um, it's the same interface we use for files. Yeah, that's good. Much more efficient because nothing goes to disk. Okay. But we have some questions here, like how do we set it up? Um, what if A generates data faster than B can consume it? Then the queue is going to get full. Or what if B consumes data faster than A can produce it? Well, then the queue is going to be empty. So what do we want to do uh, for these second things? Well, what if A is generating data too fast? What do we need to do? Anybody have any ideas? So how do we tell it to slow down? What might, what might be the simplest thing? Well, not a lock. Yeah, wait. Very good. Wait is the key, OK? So as I'm going to teach you, and you're going to hear over and over again, not a semaphore. We haven't gotten there yet. What you're going to hear over and over again from me in the next couple of weeks is the way you solve synchronization problems is by waiting. So in this particular instance, what we want is when process A executes a write system call, but the queue's full, we want A to go to sleep. Okay, and B, if B tries to execute a read system call and the queue is empty, we want to go to sleep, right? And the important part is that um, we want, uh, once there becomes memory space, if A is asleep, we want to wake it up and finish the write system call. And furthermore, once uh, there's data in queue, if B is asleep, we want to wake it up and return from read. Okay, now the question here is why wait rather than a lock? Well, the answer is locking is all about waiting, okay? So this is a type of locking, but it's a type of locking that's particularly convenient when we're uh, doing writes and reads to a, an API in the kernel because the kernel can put those threads to sleep and wake them up again when it's time, okay? Um, and deadlock here uh, is only a problem if, well, there's no deadlock here because there are no cycles. You might be saying, is there a live lock issue here where B gets put to sleep and is never woken up? That's a bug because process A has uh, refused to put any data in there. Um, and in fact, what you can do is you can set up reads to, uh, and writes to time out after a certain amount of time if they're, uh, if they're not satisfied. So um, it's not possible for process A to screw process B up uh, if it doesn't write anything. OK. Yeah, if there's a cycle, um, that's a, that's a different problem. Let's, uh, let's hold on to that for now. Okay. All right. So here's the first thing that looks exactly like that queue that I wanted to talk about, which is the Unix pipe. Um, it's also part of POSIX and it's essentially just a queue. We call it a pipe, but, um, process A writes to the pipe process B reads from it. They use the same read and write interface we've talked about before, and now we've got communication across process boundaries. The memory buffer here is going to be finite. OK, well, why? Because memory is finite. Um, and if uh, producer A tries to write when the buffer is full, it blocks. And it's put to sleep until there's space. And if consumer B tries to read when the buffer is empty, it blocks, which means it's put to sleep until there's data. So this has exactly the semantics of what we wanted. And there's a system called, called pipe, which you will become very familiar with soon, which uh, looks like this. You, you call pipe, and you give it a pointer to a, a two-element array that can store two integers. And why is that? Well, we need a file descriptor for both ends of the pipe, for both the input end and the output end. And so what this pipe call does is it uh, opens up, creates a pipe, and opens up two ends and returns two file descriptors. So when you write on the, the uh, input end, it goes into the pipe. And when you read from the output end, it comes out of the pipe. OK. Now the question about how do we know if there's data in the pipe? Can somebody answer that? Do we have to monitor? Or do we have to poll it every now and then to check? Hamming codes? Nope, no Hamming codes. So how do, how do we know? There you go. Perfect. We had a great answer there. If process B is reading and there's no data, it goes to sleep, the kernel knows when process A writes because process A wrote. Okay. The kernel 
knows this, okay? The pipe is not a, is not a separate process. The pipe, pipe is just a memory in kernel space. And so when process A goes to write, the kernel, as part of putting the data into the pipe, checks and sees that, well, the read, there's a read waiting, so it just wakes it up. So because this is all running inside of the kernel, the kernel knows, okay? And so the kernel knows when process A writes whether B needs to be woken up, and it knows when B reads whether A needs to be woken up. And so that's purely an advantage of being a kernel, uh, internal kernel interface. Okay, all right, questions? So the pipe is not a process. The pipe is just a queue inside of kernel memory whose interfaces are using system calls read and write. Okay, this is not uh, necessarily in general standard in and standard out. This is, uh, you can do anything you want, okay? So you yourself could create a pipe with uh, new file descriptors that aren't zero, one, or two, okay? Um, are there other examples of process beside read and write? I'm not sure I understand the question. So processes do all sorts of stuff, okay? Um, but reads and writes are the way that we do communication, either with uh, other processes or with the file system, okay? So you get two new file descriptors, exactly. This is an array of two file descriptors. And I'm gonna show you, for instance, uh, an example here. So here's an example where we, ex we make an, an array of integers that's got two slots in it. That's this uh, int pipe FD of two. And then I call the pipe system call by saying pipe. I give it the pointer to that array. And if what comes back is a minus one, then that's a failure. Okay, that's a pretty standard idea in Unix. And we say there was a failure and return. Otherwise, we succeeded and now we have two file descriptors for two ends of the pipe. And so the uh, pipe FD of one is the write end and pipe FD of zero is the read end. And you should do a man on pipe, by the way, to see the, the uh, um, interface there. But so all we have to do, for instance, is if I have a message, which is message in a pipe, <laughs> and, I, and I write that into the pipe and I have an extra plus one here after string length, this lets me make sure I write the, not only the message, but also the uh, null at the end. And when I'm done, it writes to the pipe and then, I'm, uh, and then I immediately read from the pipe and I just get the data back, okay? Now, why are there two closed calls? Because there's two file descriptors open, a write end and a read end. Oh, by the way, why does it say pipe FD of zero? Yes, that's a bug. Hold on. Sorry, my, uh, my mistake. Now. So, um, sorry about that. So now if you, uh, as we're continuing, let's take a look at this. So let's look at what else we can do. So let's do pipes between processors, okay? So um, the question here about where is the data, it's buffered in kernel space, yes. So because we're using system calls like write and read, we're going from user space into the kernel to access that pipe. Um, and so the, the um, buffering is entirely in the kernel, okay? All right, now, so this right now, this is only one process. So it creates the pipe and then it uses it. So this is this code example is a little uh, goofy because the process writes into the pipe and then immediately reads from the same pipe. Okay. So there's no there's no two processes. Hold on just a sec. Okay. We're getting to that example. And how do we get to that example? Well, we execute pipe, which gives us two file descriptors. There it is. So there's the um, the first file descriptor is the read end, and the second one is the write end, okay? And then when we do fork, poof. All right, now we've got a parent process and a child process that are sharing a pipe. So now if you notice, what I did earlier here, I said was a little goofy as I wrote in the write end and I read from the read end. I actually have as an option here, now both processes, the parent can read and write the pipe and the child can read and write the pipe. Okay, but that's a little goofy, right? So um, what we typically do is the following. We, we uh, generate the pipe and then we fork, okay, which 
I already kind of showed you in this picture. But now, depending on what we do, we close one file descriptor in one process and the other one in the other one. So for instance, here, if PID is not zero, then um, we, are the, um, we are the parent. And what we're saying is really should be a PID greater than zero. Sorry about that. We are the parent. And in that case, we uh, write to the, uh, the right end, which is number one, and we close the read end. Whereas in the child, uh, we read from the read end, but close the right end. Okay. Now the question here of can we use the heap for the pipe? The answer is the kernel's got the pipe, so you don't have any control over where it is. Now you may ask the, maybe you're asking the question here of where is this uh, array with two file descriptors in it? Certainly you could use the heap for that if you wanted, although it's um, probably not necessary because you're probably going to basically create a pipe in some uh, place and then use it right away. Uh, but you could certainly put the, the two file descriptors in the heap if you liked. Okay. And if you wanted two-way communication, you don't really need to have, uh, well, you don't have to have two pipes, but then the communication would get inter interleaved, but you could create two pipes, one for each direction, certainly. Okay. And we'll get to what happens with closure in a moment here. So the, the answer to the question on the chat is, if, if you have a file description table entry, and there's anybody still pointing to it, then it stays uh, open. Okay. So writing to the read end and reading from the right end uh, is not guaranteed to do anything useful. Okay. So um, here's in graphics I wanted to show you. So we're making a channel from parent to child. We've already done fork, as you can see here, we did pipe and fork. So what we're going to do is we're going to close uh, three on the parent side because we're not going to read at the parent side. And we're going to close four over here on the child side. And now that we're done, we have uh, the ability for the parent to write into the pipe. And then it gets read from the child. And so now we can send um, data, a stream of data from parent to child. But we could do the opposite. So here. We could close four on the parent side and close three on the child side. And now the child can send data to the parent process. Okay. And um, as was asked earlier, could we make two pipes? Certainly we could make a pipe to go from parent to child and child to parent, and they would be separate from each other because they'd have separate queues. Okay. How do you get end of file in a pipe? So, you know, think about this for a moment. A pipe is just, a queue in memory. So what does end of file mean? Well, what it means is there's going to be no more data coming. And so what happens is uh, after the last write descriptor is closed, the pipe's effectively closed because it only returns EOF. Um, after the last read descriptor is closed, if a write tries to write, it'll get um, the so-called sig pipe signal. Uh, we talked about signals last time. Um, and if the process ignores that sig pipe signal, then the write will fail with an e pipe error. Okay, so you could either capture the sig pipe signal, or you could get an error back from write. Those are a couple of options. And so in this instance here, uh, we close file descriptor four. So now that pipe is hanging. We're not going to uh, garbage collect the pipe yet because there's still a file descriptor pointing at it. But um, what you can see here is that the only thing that process two is going to get out of reading that's EOF. End of file. OK. All right. Now, once we have communication, we need a protocol. So a protocol is an agreement on how to communicate. So in the case of that, um, that pipe, yeah, we can send a stream of bytes from parent to child, but how does the child interpret that? Well, we may need to decide to put them into packets. So there are some system calls like send message, receive message you could do for that, or you could packetize it yourself and say, well, I'm going to send you a stream of bytes where the first one says how many bytes are in the data structure, and then I put those number of bytes. But that's starting to become a protocol where there's an agreement for how the bytes are formatted in the channel. Okay, And we're not going to go into this much today, but just to get you thinking here, okay, um, you've got a, a syntax to that protocol which says how are the bytes uh, structured together. 
um, you know, we always have this byte is followed by those bytes, whatever, and then semantics of what that means. Um, oftentimes, you can describe this by a state machine. Uh, so protocols can get pretty sophisticated. We're going to talk about the TCP IP protocol later in the term. Um, and another thing which we're not going to talk about today, but also later in the term, is the fact that across the network, for instance, you may need to even translate from one machine uh, representation to another. So if you remember the big Endian, little Endian discussion from 61C, um, it could be that when you send a message from uh, one process to another, that that other process looks at integers a different way, and you need to reformat the messages to match what they are at the other end. Now, the question here about can you use higher level constructs like fopen and fread on pipes, um, what you're going to do in that instance is you'd create the pipe, and then you can wrap um, a, a file star around it. There are, there are system calls to do that, okay, called fdopen, for instance. Okay. Um, this is not quite, uh, it's similar maybe to control F endings replaced by line feed endings under some circumstances, perhaps. Okay, and yes, this is decoding. And encoding, but it needs to be agreed upon via a standard. And so that whole idea of what is the standard for encoding and decoding gets pretty interesting, but later, okay, we'll talk about it. And by the way, another word you might be aware of is serialization. You probably talked about that in uh, some of your classes, like 61B. Okay, so some examples, um, some examples here. Yes, people are mentioning things like UTF-8 and uh, 16 and so on. That's also part of it. Here's a simple uh, protocol. Your telephone, you pick up uh, the phone, you listen for a dial tone or see that you have service. Um, not, too many people, not too many of you probably even know what a dial tone is anymore. Maybe you do. But then you dial a number, you hear ringing, and then all of a sudden on the other side you hear, hello? And then you say, hi, it's John, or uh, my favorite is, hi, it's me. It's like, well, how do you know who it is? <laughs> Um, but you might say something like, how do you think, blah, 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 blah. Um, the other side said, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Maybe you wait a little bit to think, then you say goodbye. They say goodbye, and you hang up. And this is actually a protocol where the ringing, uh, the expectation is that somebody at the other side says hello. It's always a little crazy when you get a spam call and they don't. Um, and then that hello leads to the initiator of the call saying what it's about which then uh, gets a response back, okay, which eventually causes a closing of the channel, okay, saying goodbye, and then you hang up. And these round trips here are very similar to what happens with TCP IP with the, the fin messages and so on. Okay. So um, the protocol we're going to talk about for today's, the rest of today's lecture is this web server request reply protocol. And uh, there's a communication channel of some sort that we need to figure out how to discuss in the middle here. But the client might say request over the network, say, and then the web server would give you a reply. And there's a very carefully uh, constructed protocol here. Okay. And this uh, communication from the client to the web server is certainly going to be running TCP IP, but the um, there's more to it because you got to satisfy HTTP. So there's actually uh, some standard protocol uh, with the headers and so on. Okay. All right. So this idea of cross network IPC is an interesting one because potentially you can have one server serving a whole num large number of clients, and many clients accessing a common server starts yielding some interesting questions like how does the server keep track of the clients? Okay, so how would the server keep track of the clients? Anybody have any idea there? Okay, so maybe every client has a different IP address. Well, if you're anything like, um, uh, you know, like myself, when you use a web browser, Firefox, whatever, your favorite, Chrome, uh, notice that there may be a bunch of tabs. Uh, or there may be uh, a bunch of pieces inside. And in that case, there may be many clients that the server is inter interacting with that are all at the same IP address. So then what? Okay. Okay, I see a lot of sockets and cookies. Um, 
IP address plus MAC address. No, that's not going to help you. Sequence numbers. OK, so I'm going to try to answer this question. Oh, I saw somebody say port. That's exactly right. So each unique communication, which we're going to talk about here, has both an IP address and a port on each side and a protocol. And as a result, each uh, communication channel is unique. OK, and so the unique ID is going to be a five tuple uh, that we're going to talk about in a moment. OK. So the client, let's make sure we understand, first of all, what we mean by client server. So a client is somebody that asks for service from a remote server. And uh, the clients are sometimes on, OK? They, uh, you turn your computers off. You turn your, um, you, know, you turn your cell phones off sometimes. But it's the thing that typically initiates a contact, like here's a get. Uh, over HTTP for index.html. A server, on the other hand, is typically always on, up on some well-known address that uh, can be accessed by a client. And so it's not, it doesn't typically initiate contact with clients, but it needs a fixed well-known address and port in order to be findable by clients. And of course, uh, you, make, you make your request and you get some response back. Um, now, what's a network connection? Let's be really basic. So for this lecture, it's a bi-directional stream of bytes between two processes that might actually be on different machines. Um, for now, we're going to be discussing TCP IP, okay, which is, uh, is the, basically the control protocol that's used for um, cross the network and does error recovery. Okay? And so it's a uh, unique stream of information. Okay? Um, Abstractly, a connection between two endpoints, A and B, has a queue going in both directions. So there's a queue from data sent from A to B and from B to A, which is just like we were talking about with pipes, except that this is potentially across the network. Could be on the same machine, might be in the same building, could be on different uh, continents. Okay, Could even be, I suppose, between here and the moon and back if there's somebody up there. So. We need something to help us with this. And the socket abstraction is uh, this idea of an endpoint for communication. And the key idea here is communication across the world, once again, is going to look like file I.O. with reads and writes. Okay, So here we go. So we have process. Uh, one process is going to, for instance, do a write. Okay, And that's going to go into a data structure we'll get to called a socket here, which is going to cause the communication to go across the network to another queue in which point process B can read from that other end of the socket, and we get communication. And because we're going to be using TCP IP, then we don't have to worry about errors in the middle here or anything. OK? OK, the difference between port and socket is a port is uh, des uh, describing a unique communication. The socket is a data structure, including a queue. Okay? You'll, hopefully, you'll um, see the difference about that in a moment. OK, um, if you don't, by the end of the lecture, make sure to ask again. Now, just as we were talking about with pipes, if we go to read on one side and there's no data, that process gets put to sleep until the data shows up. OK, so sockets are endpoints for communication. They're queues to hold results. Um, two sockets connecting over the network gives you inter, uh, process control or inter process communication over the network. and um, this sounds great, but now you got to start asking questions like, how do you open this? Uh, what's the namespace? How are you connect them? Okay. So um, there are lots of different types of sockets. It's true, but not all pipes are are sockets. Okay. There are ways to get things like pipes uh, that don't have sockets internally, and there's also ways of connecting sockets internally that act like pipes. Okay. So for now. Um, the pipe, the native pipe implementation is actually uh, not the socket implementation on a lot of Unix uh, uh, distributions. OK, so we need to figure out how to connect all of this. All right. Um, so what are some more details? So the first detail um, is that sockets are pretty ubiquitous. Um, what I said about POSIX not being ubiquitous everywhere is not true about sockets. So sockets are pretty much implemented on almost any operating system that wants to communicate over the network. OK, you pick it, it's got it. Um, it was standardized by POSIX, but this is part of the standard that is um, always there. OK, the thing you ought to know about, which is fun, uh, 
is that sockets came from Berkeley and um, the Berkeley Standard Distribution Unix version 4.2 was the one that first introduced sockets. All right, definitely go bears on this. This release had a whole bunch of benefits to it um, and a lot of excitement uh, from potential users. In fact, people that were there at the time it was released have told me stories about uh, how there were runners waiting to uh, get the tapes that had the latest release on them so that they could uh, quickly take them to where they were gonna be uh, uploaded and to their um, computers and run. So Berkeley 4.2 BSD had a lot of buzz, okay? Hashtag go bears. Um, and so you can be uh, proud of that. Now, um, the same abstraction is for any type of network. So you can be local within the same machine. So as I mentioned before, you could imagine two sockets being connected inside a machine using the sockets libraries in the kernel and it would look like a pipe. But what I said earlier is that not all pipes implementations use sockets, okay? Because it's a, a simpler interface. The internet, um, you can go across with TCP IP and UDP IP. And at the time of 4.2 BSD, there were a whole bunch uh, of other networking protocols. So TCP IP and UDP IP were not the only ones. There was Apple Talk and IPX and a whole bunch of native ones. Um, some of which still live in uh, deep recesses of the network, okay? Now, um, yeah, there's 162 participants in our, uh, in our uh, class right now. That is pretty funny. Um, so more details on sockets. Um, let's just, uh, it looks like a uh, file with a file descriptor. So once again, our standard, uh, our standard idea that all I.O. Uh, looks like reads and writes to files is going to be true with sockets, okay? So write adds output, read removes input, okay? Now, since this is, an I, this is I.O., there's no notion of L-seq. So there's an example of what you might think is a part of the standard interface that just doesn't make any sense for sockets. It also doesn't make any sense for pipes, okay? Uh, now, how can we... How can we use sockets to support real applications? Well, a byte stream by itself is not necessarily useful, okay? So a bidirectional byte stream uh, has no boundaries to messages. It doesn't necessarily have any interpretation. So we already talked about this. You need to add syntax and semantics. Um, you possibly need to have a serialization mechanism, okay? And so uh, we will talk at another uh, time later about um, RPC facilities and so on, okay? Now, uh, there was a the question about Kafka, which is a different thing. So we'll, uh, we'll talk to that about the end of the term. Okay, so there is no notion, by the way, as a, of append here, because there's no notion of seek. So when you write, it just goes to the end of the socket. So sockets keep things in order, just as TCP IP keeps the stream in order. Okay, so there's no append in this instance, because you can't seek. Now, um, and, or, or the other way to say that is every write is an append, okay? So let's uh, dive right in with a simple example here. So I'm gonna build, we're gonna call it a web server, but it isn't really doing HTTP. So this is a little bit of a misnomer, but let's suppose that the client sends a message and the server echoes it. That's it, so the client sends it, server echoes it. Okay, so it's an echo server. And what that might look like? Well, here I have an example of the network. You could say the left side is, uh, I don't know, Berkeley, and the right side is Beijing, and we've set up a socket between the two. Now, what that means is uh, the green boxes, the two of them on the left, are part of the same socket. They're just the two queues going either direction. And the two green boxes on the right are part of the sockets on the server side, okay? So we have two boxes for the client, two for the server, and that's because uh, it's bi-directional when you set up something, okay? Now, um, the first thing that I kind of indicated already is the server, the, it's gonna set up these sockets, which we don't have any idea how to do quite yet, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna immediately do a read. And of course the socket is empty on the read side. And so all that's gonna happen is it's gonna enter the kernel and it's gonna wait. Okay, and we saw that earlier when I showed you the, the web server example at the very beginning of the lecture. What happened is you, you did a read and if there wasn't any data, you went to wait. Okay. Meanwhile, a client comes along 
and it's going to set up an echo. So one of the things that uh, we need to do is uh, from the user, we have to figure out uh, what they want to send. And so maybe we do an fget string uh, from standard in. OK, so this is a streaming input, which will wait until you hit a carriage return. Um, and then it's going to send the data over the socket uh, by writing it. OK, so it's a write system call to the socket file descriptor. Here's our buffer. And notice, because I say string length of send buff plus one, I'm sending uh, the, uh, the null character at the end of the string in addition to the string. Um, this is things to start thinking about as you get comfortable with C. Um, and meanwhile, that write can go on right away without the data actually going out, as you remember, because writes are buffered in the kernel. And so yes, the socket's going to try to send it, but we return from the write almost immediately, at which point we go and try to read to wait for the response. And of course, we go to sleep because there's, uh, there's nothing in the read side on the client of the socket, just like there's nothing on the read side for the server. OK. Meanwhile. Back at the fort, the uh, write gets sent out across the network to the other side, at which point uh, the data wakes up the read process. The server process wakes up. It might print the thing on the local console. OK. And, um, and then it also writes the echo back, OK, at which point it gets sent across the network. It wakes up the client, maybe print something on the screen. And then, of course, we can loop back and do it over and over again. OK, and now we have an echo server. OK, so the f get s, just to be clear here, is only asking for the user here to type in the string that they want to send. It's the write that actually sends it across the network. OK. So what it means here, uh, the green boxes are the socket pieces inside the kernel. These white boxes are um, representing code places where you're interacting with the kernel. So mostly on either side, the client and the server, server are at user level. The green boxes are in the kernel. And occasionally, when I do a write or a read, I enter one of the white boxes. Okay, And potentially, I have to wait. All right. Now, um, you can force you can try to force the uh, the kernel to send the data, but in fact, and there are there are ways to do that with flush, but by and large, it'll just send it right away. So you're not you're not too worried about that. Okay. Now this is not four sockets. This is only two sockets. Okay. It's a socket is a double sided endpoint for a communication. So the two greens on the left are the client, and the two greens on the right are the socket on the server. Okay, so this is only two sockets, and each side has two queues. That's why there are four green boxes. Okay. Now let's look at this in code a little bit. Okay, so the client code, uh, what you see here is we have to get ourselves a buffer which has some maximum uh, input size. Um, so a socket is bidirectional because there are two queues inside of it. OK, a pipe only has one queue, so it's unidirectional. Yes. If you look here, we had to uh, get ourselves some character buffers. And the max in and max out are defined somewhere else in this file. Um, and then we go over and over again. Um, and uh, we basically say uh, we grab the send buff. Oh, I guess I temporarily broke this code. I apologize. But um, forget the while. Assume this is while true. We basically grab the send buff uh, from the user. And then we write it out, OK? And then we clear out the receive buff, and we read it, and then we just keep looping, OK? And the same on the server side. We read the data. We uh, write it to um, standard out, and we uh, echo it, OK? And so what happens is our write goes across the network and wakes up a read, and then the write on this side goes across the network and wakes up a write, and this repeats over and over again. Yes, it looks like DNA. It's true. Now, and notice it's, uh, yeah, it looks like DNA, I guess. Yeah. So what assumptions are we, be ma are we making here? So one of the things is we have no error correction code for what happens if a packet's lost, OK? Because we're assuming that if you write, uh, data gets read back. So with a file, unless your disk is full, the assumption is always when you write to it, you can read it back. 
when you write to a TCP socket, the assumption is the read on the other side happens. Okay, it's like pipes. Okay, if you put it in, it'll come out on the other side. Okay, let's uh, let's hold off on the chatter on on the uh, the chat for now. Okay, um, and the other thing that's important is the assumption that um, we have an in-order sequential stream. So when I put data, multiple writes into the input side of a socket, on the opposite side, it'll come out in exactly the same order, not a different order. So that, that's a property of the TCP IP protocol. Every byte that goes in comes out in the same order and comes out only once, okay? So that's a really nice semantic and it's why everybody loves TCP IP, okay? Um, there are some disadvantages to TCP IP, but this is a pretty big advantage, okay? And so when you're ready, uh, when the data is ready on the other side, what happens? Well, the file read gets whatever's there at the time, okay? So this is why to do a real version of this, you need to check, uh, you need to come up with a protocol that says, I'm gonna maybe write uh, into the, the first thing I write is the number of bytes to expect, and then I write those bytes, and then on the other side, I read the number of bytes I'm expecting, and I keep looping with read until I get that number of bytes. So to really do this correctly, you need to have a, a protocol that you've defined that lets you do things like message boundaries, okay? But for now, we're not worrying so much about this. We're also assuming that we block if nothing's arrived yet, just like pipes, okay? So TCP IP plus uh, sockets is very much like a bi-directional pipe that goes across the globe, okay? It's, it's a very simple pipe to two ends of the planet, which is pretty nice, or a pipe on the same machine, or a pipe to different machines in the same building. They all act with exactly the same interface, okay? All right, um, now, socket creation, <coughs> I think we might be interested in here, okay? So, for instance, file systems uh, provide a collection of permanent objects in a structured namespace. All right, so if you think about it, the, um, the uh, whole point of the file system is that I can name a file so that I can open it. <laughs> you know, slash uh, home, slash kubi, slash uh, classes, slash CS161, 162, whatever. There is a namespace. The problem with sockets is what's the namespace? Okay, so files exist independently of processes, and it's very easy to name a file with open. But when you start talking about sockets, sockets are kind of by their very nature transient and really only functional when they're connected, okay? So pipes partially get us that way, right? It's one-way communi one communication between processes on the same physical machine. It's got a single queue. It's created transiently by pipe, and it's passed from uh, parent to child in a way that allows us to share between two processes. And notice that in that instance, there isn't any namespace per se, but rather we called pipe, and the fact that the file descriptors are now shared is how we end up with the connection between the two processes, okay? The reason a pipe is unidirectional is although the two processes each have a right, a pointer to the right end and the read end, if they both try to write, the, the, uh, the data will get interleaved. And so I don't consider that bidirectional because you can't have two clean communications. You get two garbled combined communications. So that's why you always end up uh, closing one channel or another. And if you really want bidirectional com communication with a pipe, as I said earlier in the lecture, you create two pipes, okay? Now, um, sockets have this problem that A, we're not on the same kernel, so you know that's a little bit of a problem. Um, and we need to somehow address something all the way across the planet. How do we do that? Well, it does have the two queues for uh, you know, communication in each direction. Processes can be on separate machines. Um, so there's no common ancestor to pass something from one to the other. In fact, we could be here in Berkeley and, and in Beijing or pick your favorite uh, other place. And um, how do we name it? There's certainly no common ancestor of those processes, all right? So um, what are we gonna do? Well, the namespace, of course, is IP, 
So you're all very familiar with this namespace. So for instance, a host name like www.eecs.berkeley.edu is an example of a name that can be uniquely identified across the network and used to route traffic to it. Now, of course, we're going to have to talk about um, things like DNS and so on later in the term. But that host name really translates directly to IP. Okay. And so what is IP? Well, IP addresses, depending on whether you have IPv4 or IPv6, are 32 or 128-bit integers. And so, for instance, www.eecs.berkeley.edu would translate into some IP address, okay, which now would allow us to actually communicate across the network. But as I mentioned earlier, the IP address is not enough. If you have a browser with a bunch of tabs in it, each one of those tabs has the same IP address because there's only one machine. And so you need a way to uniquely name a connection. And that's where ports come into play. Ports are part of the TCP IP and UDP IP spec. They're 16 bits. So there's only really 65, 536 of them. And the first 1,024 are called well-known. Okay. Um, and the well-known uh, ports are ones that are, are much harder for you to uh, bind anything to. And in fact, you're going to need to be super user to use them. Um, there are some ports between 1024 and 49151, which are typically registered ports. Um, like for instance, 25565 happens to be the, uh, the port for a Minecraft server. That's uh, an important one for you all to remember. And then there's a bunch of dynamic ports or private ones. And you'll see in a moment uh, what they're about, OK? So, if we look at a connection set up over TCP IP, we're going to need something that's special here. We, the server needs to set up a, the process of uh, waiting for a client to connect. And that's called a server socket. So the server uh, basically produces a server socket. Okay? And that server socket listens on typically well-known ports that have been registered uh, with a standardization agency, and you can you could register them, but it's very hard to get the um, ports in that lower 1024 registered. Um, typically, people have uh, ports that are just well known in the higher portions. Okay, but now once the server socket is set up, now the client uh, will be able to con communicate, which is because this socket, the f the f thing the server does after creating it is it says listen, which says um, go to sleep waiting for an incoming connection. Okay, listening. See, that's an ear, by the way. So the client creates one, its end of the socket, sets a request uh, to the other end by using the IP address and the standard port. And at that point, the server uh, executes an accept, which says, well, take this connection and let's make it uh, real enough that we can communicate. So in that instance, uh, the server says, oh, I accept. And the kernel then takes this connection creates another endpoint. And notice these are both green. And the either end of them, there's a final connection phase. And now when you're done, those two ends represent two ends of a bi-directional uh, socket. And this is TCP IP, yes. OK. And when you do ping, OK, ping is, not, uh, is, is different than this. So ping uh, does not set up a connection. Ping is the ICMP protocol, which is just a datagram protocol. OK, so we haven't gotten to port. We've talked about ports a couple of times, but ports are really what's going to make this connection unique. OK, so let me talk about ports again. So both sides of the socket, let's just look at the green ones, have associated with them a five tuple, which is the source address, the source IP address, the destination IP address, the source port, the destination port, and the fact that this is a protocol like TCP IP. Together, those five things mean that this yellow connection is unique from all other um, connections that we might make between those two servers, okay? Or between those two IP addresses, excuse me. Okay, so um, why, how does this work? Well, I already mentioned that the client side of this connection um, is typically in that upper range above 49,000 of randomly or dynamically assigned uh, port numbers. So when a client first does this connection, they assign themselves a random port. So now they have their IP address, a random new port for that connection. 
the server side has its own IP address, which is what I'm remotely connecting to, and its well-known port, so here's a good one, 80 is a port you all ought to know, okay? And that's basically the typical web server port. And so what this connection did is it went from the client up to the server socket and said, hi, I'd like to make a connection on port 80. And the server says, okay, I will make that connection for you. And when you're done, you have two sides. Those are the two green sides of a uh, connected set of sockets. Each green thing is a socket on either side. And why is this yellow one different from any other yellow ones? Well, because it's got these, one of these five things on the left are unique. Okay, so what is a port again? A port is a 16-bit integer that helps define a unique connection. Okay, so each server socket has uh, a particular port that it's bound to. So I'll show you this in a moment, but this server socket, if this were a web server, it would be bound to port 80. And so the incoming connection is asking for that uh, IP address at that port 80. And that's the connection that's being requested. And so all yellow connections for this server socket are all going to have the same destination IP address and destination port number, but they're going to have different IP addresses or IP or uh, ports for the client. Okay. This is not ping. So ping is something completely different. It's kind of like our echo server, but it's a, it's a datagram protocol. Okay, this is TCP IP. Okay, now the client tells the server what its IP address and port and uh, IP address and port is. The server knows what its IP address and port is. And so when you're done, you have a unique connection. If the same socket excuse me, if the same client wants to make another one, then it needs to come up with a unique port for its side, because otherwise there wouldn't be a unique yellow connection. So in that example of the web browser we talked about with all the tabs, every tab would have a different local port associated with it, even though we're talking to the same, let's say, remote server uh, that has the same IP address and is all port 80. Okay, all right, I'm gonna move on from this. Um, but just keep in mind that this, every yellow connection has this unique property of a unique five tuple, okay? And 80 is a common one, that's web uh, browsing without, um, web browsing without any uh, security. 443 is the HTTPS protocol, 25 is send mail, et cetera. So the, in the uh, question about local host colon 500 says it's port 500 on the local machine. Yes, that is correct. Good. In fact, you can see sometimes people that ha have local servers that they're using for uh, IoT devices, for instance, it'll often be IP address colon 8080 or colon 8000. That's pretty common. Okay. Now, so all the server sockets are not operating out of the same port. There's one server socket operating on the port 80, and it spawns all the new sockets that are communicating with port 80. There, if you have port 443 or you have some other port like 25, that will be a different server socket that spawned listening on port 25. So there's one server socket for all the port 80s uh, connections, uh, one server socket for all of the port 443, et cetera, connections. Okay, now, so in concept, what happens here is the server creates the server socket, that's this blue one, and part of that creation is uh, binding it to an address, which is its current host IP address and the port like 80 that it's gonna do service on. And then it's gonna execute listen, which means at that point, we are listening for the connection for incoming. Okay, and basically we are gonna try to execute accept and that'll put us to sleep until somebody actually comes in. Okay, so later uh, the cl a client uh, creates a socket it, and it does a connect operation, which says, I want to connect to uh, a remote server that has this host name or this host, excuse me, IP address and port, which, uh, assuming we've did this correctly, will go across to the server, uh, which is busy listening. Um, the, the system call will accept it, in which case this three-way uh, three protocol happens. And when we're done, we now have a connection socket on either side uh, with a unique 
five tuple defining this as a unique connection. And every subsequent client that tries to do this will get a different uh, unique five tuple or unique connection. Okay. Now, the, uh, once the server is uh, ready, it says, oh, I have a socket. Okay, I'm going to do a read request on the socket. Well, of course, that's going to go to sleep right away until the write request from the client comes in and says, I want to look at some HTTP address. And meanwhile, uh, there'll be a read, okay, on the other side that wakes up, writes a response that'll get sent to the other side. And we do this uh, combined, write the request, wait for the response. Here we go, read the request, write the response on either side, okay? So each connection socket the server owns has a different port. That is correct. Okay. Now, uh, when we're done, we close the client socket, and then the server goes back and does another accept, and that's how we serve multiple requests for now. Okay. Now you can see probably right off the bat. Uh, if by the way, there's no race condition because the incoming connection requests go into the server and they're put into the queue using synchronization uh, that we haven't talked about yet. Okay. No race conditions. Um, so the client protocol that you see here is pretty simple. So look, we, uh, we first get an adder info structure defining uh, the host that we're trying to connect to, okay, with host name and port name. And so this is look up the host. Um, basically, I'm not gonna show you that until the end of the lecture if we get there, but this is gonna return a unique host name, port name combination for who I'm trying to communicate with. I'm gonna create the socket file descriptor. And then, um, so that's now I have a socket here. So the client's got this file descriptor, which is an integer. The socket structure is inside the kernel. Okay. And, um, and then I try to do a connect. And that connect immediately says, uh, waits until the connection finishes. And then when it emerges, this SOC file descriptor is no longer a disconnected socket. It's a connected socket. And now, we uh, can go ahead and do our client operations, whatever that are, whatever they might be, which could be doing lots of reads and requests and over and over again, um, and then closing. Okay, the server side is a similar idea, but it's it's got this server socket. So if you look here, um, we set up uh, which address family we want. We bind it, which means basically we say that we want to listen on a certain address and port. Okay, and so binding basically attaches an address to a socket. Creating the socket just makes the queue. We bind an address to it, and then we do listen instead of connect. And now in this while loop, we over and over again, we accept the next connection, we process it, we close, we go and accept another one. Okay, and so we just do this over and over again, and we're good to go. Um, can anyone see what's wrong with this protocol? What seems unfortunate about this particular server implementation? Yeah, one connection at a time, right? So this can't be good. So uh, what can we do? Well, first of all, how might we protect ourselves? Because if you notice, we're kind of running right here. Uh, we're kind of running in the same uh, process over and over again. We might want to protect ourselves. So what we can do in that case is actually take what I just showed you and add a fork and let the child communicate with the client and do a wait until the child is done, close the connection uh, and go back. Okay, and notice when we fork, because we fork, the listen socket is gonna uh, end up on both sides. And of course the child doesn't need the listen socket because it's not a server. So it closes the listen socket. On the other hand, the parent doesn't need the connection socket because it's not serving the client, and so it's going to close the connection socket. So this is just like the pipe example I gave you earlier, where we create a pipe, we fork, and then each side closes one of the two file descriptors. Okay. All right. We're not serving multiple yet. We're just putting protection in here. So now every child uh, is running in a protected environment. We haven't gotten to the multiple yet, okay? But you can see we're coming with that. The only thing I did that's a little different here is I, when I once I accepted that incoming connection, I fork, and here, if I'm the child, which is PID equal to zero, I close the server socket. I At that point, I go ahead and serve the client, and then I close the connection socket and exit. Meanwhile, the server closes the connection socket because it doesn't communicate with the clients, and it waits. Okay, so this is all that we changed. But of course, 
we want concurrency, okay? Or par parallelism if that's available. At least concurrency would be even better because if we could have multiple clients' requests going on simultaneously, then when one of them is sleeping because it's doing a disk access, the other one could be being served. Okay, so even if we don't get parallelism, we still want more than one request going on at once. So we've kind of broken that so far. Okay, and why do we need protection? Well, um, what we can do is we can, in that other process, we can limit access uh, to only those things that let it connect with a small part of the uh, file system or whatever to make sure that uh, we are safe. Okay, and just, uh, I know we're running low on time. Hold on for just a second, we're almost done. The question of why we're closing sockets here is because when we fork, we fork all of the file descriptors and on the child side, it doesn't need the server socket that's being listened on and the, and the parent doesn't need the connection socket, okay? And so we're closing either side. So here's a simple example where um, what we're gonna do is we're not waiting here, right? So after we fork, the parent closes the connection socket and goes back and accepts another one immediately. Okay, and yes, the child could listen, all right? So uh, what you do with the child code is you make sure to do all that closing and then you set up your environment before you start doing the uh, processing, okay? But if you notice here, uh, we close the connection socket and we immediately go accept another one. So all I did by removing that wait right here, you see the, I commented out wait, now suddenly we have concurrency, okay? Multiple requests at once. Now there's a comment in the chat saying this seems heavyweight. Well, it is because we're creating a brand new process every time, okay? Now, it's, uh, it's not, it's the same. Okay, so let's be careful about this. I wanna, I see some chatter in the chat. I wanna make sure we got it. This uh, server socket is the same all the time, but we don't use it for communication. We use it for listening, okay? So the parent, has the server socket and it's the one doing accept. And so it just do that, does that over and over again. And each time accept comes back, it comes with a new socket connection, okay? And each child gets a different socket connection. So the parent keeps accepting new connections. Every one of these connections is A, unique because it's got a different five, five tuple. It's got a different, at least remote IP address and port combination, could be just the port, but something there is unique and it's got a unique process. So every loop, the, every accept gets a new process for a new child uh, connection, okay? Um, now, just before we uh, finish up a little bit here, so the server address, so one of the ways we set up the address at the server side is we say which port we're interested in, and you may ask if the port is a 16-bit integer, why is this a char star? Well, the, many of these interfaces, you can do man on them. Uh, basically take in a, a char star, which is a string representation of a number, okay? But anyway, what we do here is we set up things like what family are we communicating with with this socket? And the way you've got to think about families here is it used, when sockets first came out, there was not only IP out there, there were many other options. So what we're basically saying is we're going to be a stream, which means TCP IP. Um, we're not going to say what family it is because we're going to take whatever comes in and we're gonna uh, bind to a particular server and port, okay? There's a flip side with the client, which is probably more interesting. You guys should look at this after the lecture, but if what comes in is uh, a particular host name and port that we're interested in, um, then we can look it up by using something called git add or info, and what that does is that returns uh, a structure, the server structure, which is an adder info that has all the information about what IP address and port uh, we are so that then we can bind for the server socket. Okay. So finally, uh, if we're willing to not have protection on every uh, connection, but instead we wanted lightweight, we could do threads. So here's an example where instead of fork, all we do is we create a thread, the spawned thread handles the request and the main thread just goes back and accepts again. Okay, and so now that's, a thread per connection, that sounds great, unless you get slash dotted, okay? And you could easily have a situation where so much incoming traffic spawns so many threads that you crash your kernel. This is bad. So what should you do there? How do you prevent, uh, well, 
it's true you can't fork, but we're not forking here right now anyway. We're just doing threads. Limit the number of threads. Great. Okay, and the way we do that, I'm only going to start talking about this briefly today, but uh, the way we limit threads is we can create something called a thread pool, which has this basic idea where we create a bunch of threads at the beginning, but it's a fixed number. And then every time an incoming request comes in, we put the connection on an incoming queue. And then when a thread becomes free, it just goes back, dequeues the next connection and handles it. Okay. So um, this is a way of, a thread pool is a way of bounding the number of threads. All right. So we're done for today. So in conclusion, we've been talking about inter-process communication of how to get communication facilities between different environments, namely different processes. Okay. Pipes are an abstraction of a single queue, and you can create it in a parent and then uh, pass it off to children and uh, decide which direction you want it to go. Um, sockets are an abstraction of two queues, but across the network, potentially. And you, you have two ends. You have a read end and a write end on both sides, OK? So you can have two streams that are not interleaved with each other. You get file descriptors back from the socket. It gives you a single file descriptor that you can both read and write to uh, the same file descriptor. So this is different from a pipe. It's one file descriptor that handles both reads and writes. And the direction that uh, things go in depends on whether you're reading or writing, OK? And you can inherit file descriptors with fork facilities, which is why, for instance, here, when we did this example, uh, when we forked, we end up, we ended up with uh, all of the sockets on the child side and the parent side, which meant the child and the parent had to close off uh, the sockets they weren't using. All right, um, I think we're good for now. Um, I'm gonna call it a night. Thanks for hanging with me, everybody. And uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Have a good night. <laughs>